When we hear the word Atlantis, our imagination erupts into life. Great sparkling cities, tall, elegant people, an amazing technology of a once all-powerful nation that is now lost to us in the midst of time. Thousands of people have spent their entire lives searching for its truth, hunting the remnants of a race that spawned civilization. Others have disappeared into the world of psychic phenomena to seek out the secrets, and even more have looked towards the stars and an alien answer. The real truth about Atlantis is actually very profound and tells a tale that every schoolchild should be taught. Yes, there are real people in this tale. Yes, there are real places but there are also very real inner truths. These truths stretch back in time to the origins of civilization itself. They answer a great many questions we have about a great many mysteries. From the Bible to angels, from historical floods to natural disasters, and from the evil in mankind to the existence of aliens. The tale of Atlantis brings them all into light from the dark depths of an ancient sunken abyss. For over 2,000 years, mankind has grappled with the question, what was Atlantis and where did its people originate? From great sea power of ancient times to idealistic utopia, from pawn for Nazi propaganda to home of the ancient aliens. The full weight of human imagination has been brought to bear on the mystery that is Atlantis. Who do we believe? What is the evidence? Where did it all begin? Where and when will it end? It's time to break apart the myth and reveal the hard evidence and discover Atlantis. So what does the word itself mean, and where did it originate? Two small dialogues, called Timaeus and Critias, written by the Greek philosopher Plato in around 360 BC, first mention Atlantis. It is named after the Greek titan god Atlas, who holds up the world on his shoulders. Atlantis is the island of Atlas. According to Plato, Atlantis was a great land and a sea power situated in front of the Pillars of Hercules. This great power had existed 9,000 years before Plato. That's about 11,000 years ago.
it had conquered much of Europe and Africa. However, when they attempted to invade Athens, the island sank into the ocean in a single day and night of misfortune. From the moment Plato put pen to paper, Atlantis became a mystery of debate on all levels, from the idea that it actually existed to the concept of it being a utopian dream. In the Middle Ages and later periods, humanist and Renaissance writers turned Atlantis into an allegorical heaven on Earth. By the 19th century, it was turning back to a very real possibility that it had existed, and indeed still may. One thing is sure, the idea of Atlantis has inspired the imagination of countless individuals throughout the centuries and still does. To academics, the tale is one of many myths woven into Plato's works for purely stylistic reasons. He was conceptualizing the ideal state just as he did so in his book, The Republic. He introduces Atlantis via an oldest story to give it credence. In Cretius, Plato tells the tale of Solon visiting Egypt. There he met a priest called Seus, who relayed the story of a war between ancient Athens and Atlantis. Some say that real events may have influenced Plato, such as the eruption of Santorina, the invasion of the Sea Peoples, and even the Trojan War. Most, however, insist that Plato created the story with minor inspirations, such as the failed Athenian invasion of Sicily. Plato introduced Atlantis, first in Timaeus, which begins with the creation and structure of the universe as seen by Plato. He discusses ancient civilizations and muses about the ideal society. He asks whether his friends might know of any such place. Critias answers that he knows of a supposedly historical place and events that surround it. Athens is the perfect state with Atlantis in opposition, it being the opposite of perfect. Critias states that the gods divided the land amongst themselves and Poseidon, the god of the sea, was given Atlantis. Larger than Libya and Asia Minor combined, it was in this tale to be sunk by an earthquake, turning into an impassable muddy shoal. Egyptians, he said, described Atlantis as having mountains in the north being hundreds of miles across, made up of numerous islands, with the central island being around a half a mile in diameter. It is probably important to understand the layout and description of the islands of Atlantis, because one thing is for certain, Plato would never include such details on a whim. Like many other myths, the details could point to a real location, such as in the case of Troy, 
or refer to something like sacred geometry. The real site of Atlantis, although probably an ancient subtle allusion to Gnostic beliefs, could in fact be based upon an ancient folk memory of Mexico, which is variously called Itlan, Otlan, Atlan, Otlan, Mazalan, Cacalan, and Tolan, all sounding remarkably similar to Atlantis. Plato places Atlantis beyond the Pillars of Hercules. There are only the Americas beyond the Pillars. He says it is larger than Libya, which was seen as most of Africa to Plato. Any sight of an atlas will show that the Americas match this description. It was said to be a great empire, stretching for miles. And with each passing year, our archaeologists and scientists are further uncovering huge landscapes previously thought to be uninhabited and which now reveal the signs of having been lived in and cultivated on a massive scale. Also, we have seen from the timeline that the Harappan culture of India, the pre-Indian civilization, was a great seafaring society. Surely, there has been more proof that these cultures spread across the seas and traded religious ideas, if not more. Well, there is a lot more. The ancient boats used by the Chinese, Japanese, and Indians were sampans. This is interesting because in South America, the tribes of the coast called them Mayu, Chimpana, Champan, and Sampan, virtually the same terms for vessels across the ancient world. This idea of common languages would be easier to discover had not the invading European countries virtually destroyed them. However, there are plenty of similarities in structure and meaning to make the case. You will notice from the very names of places such as Atlan and Otland that the letters to Lan are common. In ancient myth, the serpent race of India known as the Nagas was said to reside in Patalan or Patlan. An interesting fact when we consider that all these cultures worshipped the serpent. In fact, certain Venezuelan Indians known as Paria actually lived in the area known as Atlan. The Parias, according to Braghine, in the shadow of Atlantis, were white-skinned and possessed folklore of a great cataclysm that destroyed their original homeland. In Sanskrit, which is widely thought to be the root of many of the world's languages, Tala is surface, and the N refers to the people living there. So Talan is people of the surface. 
The A suffix denotes below or no longer. So, Atalan is people of below the surface, just like Atlantis. Amazingly, Tala is also an epithet for the Hindu god Siva, and therefore Talan means the people of Siva. Veracruz in the Americas is said to be derived from Vela Cruz, which is Spanish for seeing the cross. Not an unusual thought considering this was a symbol of the feathered serpent savior Quetzalcoatl. However, in Sanskrit, Vera Kurus means simply Kurus the hero, a title for the tribe which is said to have disappeared from India following the deluge, indicating through language alone that there must have been contact, especially when we consider the rest of the data. But how did they transport themselves? Possibly on sampans, which we have seen are the same. But also, the savior deity Quetzalcoatl and the god Vishnu are both said to have traveled to Patala via an eagle and a raft of snakes. Quetzalcoatl disappeared back to Talapalan, the place of the people of Pala, which is in fact Baha in India. From this place, it was considered that the world's greatest architects and builders emerged after the flood, and they spread across the globe. In all likelihood, they are ultimately responsible for the world's serpentine-related stone megaliths and monoliths such as Avebury in England and the serpent mounds of North America. The very word Attila means an abode of these serpents. The Hindus mixed, traded with, and respected the Greeks. As we can see in Taxila, they were great cross-cultural mixing pots and hives of religious and philosophical debate. And indeed, it is highly likely that the stories of Atlantis evolved from Hindu myths, such as the story of the city of Devaraka in the Mahabharat, the capital of Krishna, which sank. The age of the serpent goes back to and beyond the deluge and was taken across the seas to the Americas. Even the architecture of Atlantis, with its many circular banks and ditches, brings to mind the thousands of cup and ring marks, spirals, and other serpent shapes seen on the lifts or stones across the world. Returning back to the tale Plato gave us, we must look at the other parts of the tale which may reveal a clue to the reality of Atlantis. Poseidon had five pairs of male twins. The eldest was Atlas, and he was made the king of the whole island, an ocean now called the Atlantic. His twin, Gadaris, was given a part of the island near the Pillars of Hercules. Poseidon carved the mountain where his love resided into a palace. He created three moats of increasing width. His people, the Atlanteans, then built a series of bridges from the mountain city for access. A huge canal was dug out to the sea and tunnels into the rings of land for ships to pass. Docks were carved directly into the massive rocks. Each entrance had gates and towers, and walls surrounded each ring made from red, white, and black rocks. These were covered in brass, tin, and orichalcum. Each of these things have symbolic meaning. Red, for instance, was a symbol for growth and decay. Orichalcum is an unknown metal used for armor. There is an earlier account of Atlantis written by Hellenicus of Lesbos. There is very little in the fragment that exists, and this deals mainly with genealogy. There is, however, a link between a place called Syracuse, where Plato once lived, and his account of Atlantis. It has been shown to have a number of parallels in physical layout and fortifications. Cranter, who studied under one of Plato's students, and therefore, from very close to Plato's own time, actually stated he believed Atlantis to be real. 
he wrote a commentary on Timaeus, which is now lost. However, there is a written report on it from the 5th century. This is what was written. Cranter also says that Plato's contemporaries used to criticize him jokingly for not being the inventor of his republic, but copying the institutions of the Egyptians. Plato took these critics seriously enough to assign to the Egyptians this story about the Athenians and the Atlanteans, so as to make them say that the Athenians really once lived according to that system. Cranter adds that this is testified by the prophets of the Egyptians, who assert that these particulars are written on pillars which are still preserved. The writer Proclus also said, We must bear in mind concerning this whole feat of the Athenians, that it is neither a mere myth nor unadorned history, although some take it as history and others as myth that an island of such nature and size once existed is evident from what is said by certain authors who investigated the things around the outer sea. For according to them, there were seven islands in that sea in their time, sacred to Persephone, and also three others of enormous size, one of which was sacred to Hades, another to Ammon, and another one between them and Poseidon, the extent of which was a thousand stadia and the inhabitants of it, they add, preserve the remembrance from their ancestors of the immeasurable large island of Atlantis, which had really existed there, and which for many ages had reigned over all islands in the Atlantic Sea, and which itself had likewise been sacred to Poseidon. So it was, or is, a massive island, sacred to the gods, and sits in the Atlantic, somewhere between Europe and America, maybe. Proclus was not alone in believing Atlantis to be real. So too did the historians and philosophers Strabo and Posidonius. A few decades after Plato, another writer by the name of Theopompus spoke of a land called Meropis, here, a race of men grew twice the size of normal men and inhabited two cities known as Eusebes and Machamos, the pious town and the fighting town. Most scholars believe that Theopompus was in fact imitating or copying Plato, and thus much of the detail has merged with the mythology of Atlantis. The next actual written work about Atlantis comes from the historian Philo in the first century AD. He claims that the successor of Aristotle, a man named Theophratus, said, And the island of Atlantis, which was greater than Africa and Asia, as Plato says in the Timaeus, in one day and night was overwhelmed beneath the sea in consequence of extraordinary earthquake and inundation, and suddenly disappeared becoming sea, not indeed navigable, but full of gulfs and eddies. The Christian writer Tertullian said that Atlantis was real and that it was equal in size to Libya or Asia, showing that he was familiar with Plato's description. Another Christian, Anobius, not surprisingly, said the destruction of Atlantis was due to their pagan ways. It is interesting that Atlantis was also being compared with the Great Flood from the Bible, a sudden destruction of populations way back in antiquity and only remembered now as legend. Scientific evidence does show floods around the globe at various times, and some have compared the tsunamis caused by the eruption of Santorini in the biblical flood. In truth, it may be that other cultures wrote of this massive destruction of an entire civilization, but with different names and perspectives. A Hebrew text from the 14th century, discussing calculations for longitude, states, Some say that they begin at the beginning of the Western Ocean and beyond. 
For in the earliest times, there was an island in the middle of the ocean. There were scholars there who isolated themselves in the pursuit of philosophy. In their day, that was the beginning for measuring the longitude of the inhabited world. Today, it has become covered by the sea. From the 16th century onwards, speculation surrounding Atlantis spread, and with new European discoveries in the Americas and elsewhere, there was a good reason to suggest there might just be traces of these great islands somewhere. It was in this era of speculation that Sir Thomas More first uttered the name Utopia. It was a work inspired directly by the tales of Atlantis and accounts from travelers to far-off lands. This Utopia was situated in the New World of the Americas and indeed inspired many people to venture across the Atlantic themselves. Plato's description of a massive continent mirrored the size and scope of the New World of the Americas for many. Sir Francis Bacon continued the theme in his work, The New Atlantis, where his idealistic paradise was situated off the western coast of America. It was becoming popular belief that Atlantis had indeed been based upon stories of the Mayans and Aztec civilizations. It was an era of grand Christianity and evidence for many of the Old Testament tales was being sought out. Europeans saw most indigenous people as inferior and comforted themselves with the notions that white men had built the massive structures that were being found. A common history between the tribes of Israel and Europeans to those people who must have built such pyramids and palaces. This was also being brought into line with the concepts of Atlantis and gave them a satisfying explanation. However, just because of the racism of our ancestors does not mean there could not be some truth to the location and origin of the Atlantis myth. By the mid-19th century, Mesoamerican scholars were proposing officially that Atlantis must relate to the Mayan and Aztec cultures. It was stated that the Toltecs were the surviving remnant of the Atlanteans, and the Aztecs descended from these. Such ideas, along with romantic drawings, fostered the popular imagination, and soon a mixture of Egyptian, Greek, Mayan and Aztec imagery was being created for a fantasy world around the legend of Atlantis. It is difficult today to understand the credence that was given to such thoughts. We have modern science, geological surveys, archaeological digs, post-Rosetta Stone translations of major historical texts, a broad and yet fairly detailed account of much of history. Back in the 19th and early 20th century, scholars were still developing a science of historical research, and this included use of a lot of imagination to fill in the gaps. One man who successfully used his imagination and strong willpower to unlock an age-old mystery was Heinrich Schliemann. Ever since Homer had written down the story of Troy, mankind had wondered how much of it was true. When Schliemann discovered Troy in modern-day Turkey, which was believed to have been legend, the fire once again ignited for Atlantis. Scholars claimed to have discovered a connection between the Greek and Mayan languages, and suddenly the game was open for all to play. The writer Ignatius Donnelly tried to prove that all known civilizations were descended from Atlantis. He drew parallels between the creation of stories of various cultures and stated that the true Garden of Eden was really in Atlantis. It was Donnelly who inspired a 19th century Atlantis revival and began a march towards New Age concepts of the ancients. The world was about to be given a whole new interpretation of the Atlantis myth. 
and an array of fanciful and bizarre concepts would merge into the popular psyche. The Theosophical Society would take it all, mold it, and repackage it in The Secret Doctrine by Madame Blavatsky. The book she claimed had been originally dictated in Atlantis itself. In the book, Blavatsky completely ignored Plato's statement that Atlantis was the opposite of pure and gold. Instead, she described them as cultural heroes. They were part of what she called a root race, succeeded by her own Aryan race, and we all know where that idea led us. The Theosophicists claimed that Atlantis reached its peak of civilization around one million years ago when it finally destroyed itself through the dangerous use of psychic and supernatural powers. There is absolutely no evidence for any of the claims other than their own self-professed psychic abilities to communicate with Atlanteans. The merging of myths and the retelling of the Atlantis legend would eventually provide the Nazis with one of pretenses for their Aryan philosophy, which resulted in mass genocide. In 1934, Julius Evola claimed the Atlanteans were Nordic supermen who had originally come from the North Pole and others followed suit. This creative surge surrounding Atlantis is now in the popular psyche. People see it as a home of advanced technology, of superhuman abilities of perfection. Powerful energy crystals and mystical magical ways pushed aside any concepts of a real city-state inhabited by real people. During the course of the 1960s and beyond, Modern understanding of plate tectonics and continental drift has eroded such New Age philosophies and science took over. Today, most scholars see the story of Atlantis as a method of teaching. Breaking down Plato's writing methods and Greek storytelling reveals that he may in fact have been asking us to examine our own culture, politics, government. We have missed the point, they say, if we go around the world attempting to discover the lost continent. Others still point to Schliemann and how he actually found a city of legend from Greek myth. So where should we look? Where is this ancient place? Is it in the realm of thought and philosophy? Or is there a possibility that it may have once existed like Troy? There literally are dozens of hypothetical locations put forward by the modern-day explorer. Some completely ignore Plato's words and don't even look to the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of the locations have similarities to the Atlantis tale, such as the catastrophic end, waterways that existed close to the time frame. Most of the proposed locations fall within the Mediterranean Sea, Sardinia, Crete, Sicily, Cyprus, Malta, and the most popular one, Santorini. There are also ancient cities that come under the spotlight, such as Troy and Tantalus. Our first port of call is the most popular, Santorini. Located in the Aegean, it is today known as Thera. Many experts claim that it was once the home of an ancient Minoan civilization from Crete. Seen as a wise and cultivated society, it is easy to understand how they may have been seen as Atlanteans. Like the people of Atlantis, the Minoans worshipped the bull, and this had been used to link them together. But the problem remains that many cultures of the period, such as the Egyptians, worshipped the bull as well. It is also not beyond the pillars of Hercules as Plato stated. In and around the 16th century BC, Santorini erupted, destroying the society completely. 
it caused a massive tsunami that also destroyed the Minoan society on Crete and spread disaster far and wide, with flooding as far as Egypt. It is speculated that this disaster influenced Plato in his storytelling, but it is thousands of years late and in the wrong location for it to be Atlantis. Speculation, New Age psychic ideas, Nazi propaganda, treasure hunters, and more, and yet no one has found real hard evidence. That was until 2011. A television team working under Professor Richard Freund actually claimed to have found evidence for Atlantis in Andalusia. It was their belief that Atlantis had been destroyed by a tsunami in the area previously discovered by Spanish scientists. The team used satellite imagery of a suspected submerged city north of Cadiz and found what they believed to be a multi-ring ancient dominion. They claimed that citizens of Atlantis fled to other cities in locations close by. However, Spanish scientists have completely dismissed the speculations, calling the claims fanciful. It is yet to be proven beyond doubt to be the location for Atlantis. The team were not alone in their claim, however. German researchers and historians have also stated the area to be a likely location. The claims center around a place called Tardesis, which is said to have been a basis for Plato's work on Atlantis by some historians in the 1920s. The writer Herodotus stated that it was situated beyond the Pillars of Hercules, a statement Plato also used for Atlantis. They traded widely and seemed to have been wealthy. A local port was built now known as Cadiz. And yet, apart from the good professor, no other scholars accept the claims. Many look beyond the Pillars of Hercules, now known as the Straits of Gibraltar, and into the Atlantic Ocean. It has been claimed that Atlantis was a northern European sunken island, such as Doggerland or Bergen Island, which was flooded by a tsunami in around 6100 BC. Others have claimed Ireland to be Atlantis, with its mysterious history of mighty warriors. The Canary and Madeira Islands have also been claimed due to their location just beyond the Mediterranean, but no evidence has been forthcoming. Various studies on the islands, including the Azores and beneath the ocean waves, have resulted in a complete lack of evidence. Several other locations have been speculated upon. Antarctica, the Caribbean, an island near Cuba, the Bahamas, and South America. None of them have come anywhere near the amount of evidence required to prove beyond doubt that they are indeed Atlantis. There are a number of more modern claims that we must look at, such as the idea that Atlantis had something to do with ancient aliens. Before we do, it's time to take a look at a few of the problems with the original texts from Plato. Doing so will help us be clear-sighted when listening to claims of aliens and such. Atlantis is said to be beyond the pillars of Hercules or modern-day Gibraltar, and the sea is said to be impassable. Unfortunately, nowhere in any historical texts is this stated. The sea has always been fine for shipping. Atlantis is said to have sunk so, does this rule out any islands that are now viewable above the waves? Plato said his knowledge came from Solon, who himself learned of it from the Egyptians. For well over a hundred years, archaeologists and historians have been researching Egypt. They have a lot of knowledge and can even tell us what a particular pharaoh ate for dinner, and yet not one mention of Atlantis. As there is no scientific backing for channeled messages, we have to rule out anything from those who use them, including Edgar Cayce and Madame Blavatsky. 
This destroys such claims of tall, highly intelligent people who glow or have psychic powers. If they indeed exist, then there would be a lot more historical and archaeological evidence for them, and Plato might have found such powers interesting enough to include in his own tale. What Plato did tell us is clear. Atlantis was huge and made up of concentric rings of land and water situated beyond Gibraltar. There is no argument with those statements, and yet, no sunken domain the size of two countries has been spotted beneath the waves of the Atlantic yet. Modern satellite technology and geographical surveys have revealed the floor of the Atlantic, as can be seen on Google Earth, and such a massive and unusual shape would have been spotted. One of the most used claims that is completely false is that the Atlanteans were technologically advanced. Plato mentions nothing of the sort. These are all from psychics and New Age philosophers speculating or channeling. There are no mentions of flying machines, psychic powers, pyramids, lasers, or any other kind of science fiction. Again, if such things had existed 11,000 years ago, then other cultures and trading partners would have mentioned them. The Egyptians certainly would have. It all makes for great entertainment and has indeed fed such wonderful television shows such as Stargate, but it remains science fiction. Many of those early writers who made fanciful claims for Atlantis were radically oriented, claiming that Mayans and Aztecs were not capable of creating their own pyramids and grand structures. Science moved forward and evidence overcame such bigotry. Today, similar claims are made, but instead of white Europeans or clever Egyptians being the minds behind the mystery, it is said that the knowledge came from the aliens. However we dress it up, it is still racist and bigoted to assume ancient people could not build such large structures without outside intervention. What they neglect to remember is that mankind spread around the globe from the same source, that the sun, moon, and stars in the skies as deities were seen by all men. All mankind had the same needs, the same evolutionary drives, the same desire to meet their gods in the afterlife. Similarities around the globe are all easily explained through the similarities in the biological entity called human and the environment in which he lives. And this brings us to a very important point. Plato, when writing his Republic, or texts about Atlantis, was passing on a message to us all about good and bad, right and wrong. About ways to set up a strong society that understands the nature of man. So many rules and regulations are created by humans that forget the nature of the beast. Atlantis and its downfall is possibly just an allegory of what comes to all those who believe they are more than they are. Plato was a teacher of men. Not all that is taught is literal fact. Some teaching is better done through fables. It has always been this way. The problem arises when we start to believe a man really walked on water and a virgin lady gave birth. The same can be said of Atlantis in many ways. Do we believe the writings of a man who claimed psychic connection to the souls of Atlantis? Do we accept that they had incredible technology, crystals of power, came thousands of years ago in a spaceship spawned mankind, and on and on? Or do we look at what was written, the surrounding archaeological discoveries from the period, the contemporary writings, in short, the facts? 
So, if we understand that Plato was creating a story for the purpose of teaching, could it be that there was some kind of real story upon which it is based? Ignoring the timeline of 11,000 years ago, was there a series of events that Plato stole for his teaching device? The answer is maybe. In the 5th century BC, there existed a delicate balance of power between Athens and Sparta, much like that stated between Athens and Atlantis by Plato. A surprise earthquake struck Sparta, killing more than 20,000 of them. This demise in numbers sparked Sparta's neighbors and indeed subjects to begin what is known as the Earthquake Wars. Sparta refused aid from Athens and hostilities between them began. In 426 BC, one of the most destructive earthquakes from antiquity struck Athens with the following tsunamis causing chaos. The Spartan army camped nearby and ready to attack, but more earthquakes forced them to flee. An island called Atlante was home to an Athenian fort. Absolute chaotic destruction came in the form of a massive sea wave. There were many deaths and the coastline was changed forever. In the 4th century BC, a peace treaty was finally struck but was quickly followed by yet another earthquake, destroying the cities of Helike and Bura. Helike had been a wealthy city and capital of a league of city-states. It had been a center for the worship of Poseidon and was revered by many. It was a relatively peaceful civilization and inspired many to see it as a perfect society. The destructive power of the earthquake and the following tsunami destroyed every building and Posenius wrote that even the foundations were lost for all time. Following the disaster, the remnants of this once glorious city were divided amongst its neighbors. Eventually, legend emerged that Poseidon himself had caused the destruction for the defiling of his sanctuary. Writers started to say that Helike's remains now lie deep below the ocean floor. It was into this very period that Plato was born and all the news and discussion of the events would have been widespread. Looking at the various real historical events in the area just before and at the time of Plato, it is clear to see where he gained his inspiration of political perfection and ultimate demise. And yet, with every passing decade, a new discovery emerges of ancient structures on the ocean floor. Pyramids, great walls, strange man-made objects seem to be everywhere. Who knows? But one day, we may just discover the remnants of that ancient civilization called Atlantis. In each age, the story has undergone a metamorphosis, from Greek deities to sacred spirits of some unseen realm, from Nazi propaganda to little green men. Atlantis will continue to be a mirror to society. And in many ways, it points us towards the beginning of civilization itself. Wherever we go and into whatever cultural history we delve, we discover a story similar to the one we know about Atlantis. Why would this be? Finding the key to this strange conundrum is something thousands of men and women across the globe have struggled to do. But, there are good reasons for the lack of concrete discovery. They have all been looking in the wrong place, at the wrong people, and for the wrong thing. For too long, historians have focused on a few words left to us by Plato and misunderstood what he was really telling us. Could it be that even Plato didn't understand what had been told to him? But what about joining the dots? Across the world, there are remnants and legends of a mystical past left undiscovered by our misunderstanding. 
The real Atlantis can and will only be discovered by seeing the bigger picture because Atlantis is all around you right now. From Lemuria to Avalon, from Atlantis to Valhalla, the real journey starts now. Maybe it's time to forget everything you have been told. Throw out the preconceptions about an island of circles that sank beneath the waves and open your mind to a brand new possibility that Atlantis was much more than you could ever imagine. Could this be the story of the real Atlantis? Is this the real lost history of mankind itself? This is the tale of a mass migration of people such as the world has never seen since. For just a moment, let us consider something very strange and bizarre. Let's return to the concept of Mexico and let us imagine that Atlantis, the name, may have something to do with it. A Greek myth emerging from the other side of the Atlantic? Well, not quite. You see, it may in fact be those people in Mexico had the same or similar names and beliefs as much of the ancient world for a very good reason. That ancient serpent-worshipping people spread out across the globe and took with them these names and beliefs. In all likelihood, the original people we vaguely call serpent worshippers are ultimately responsible for the world's serpentine-related stone megaliths and monoliths. These people known as the Watchers or Shining Ones in the Bible are responsible or raising great stone monuments across the world. These are the people of the idea of Atlantis and the originator of this myth the ancient serpent god himself came from beneath the waters. He came from the place below, Atlantis. Jeffrey Ash in The Ancient Wisdom says, According to one theory, all primordial serpents of myth are derived from a Sumerian arch serpent in subterranean waters whose name was Zu. Water is, by many myths around the world, the home of the serpent spirit. There are many hundreds of such myths across pagan Europe, changed and altered by the later Christian church who by their meddling eroded the real history of the Atlanteans that spread their serpent worship and knowledge across the world. Serpent water deities were replaced with saints, such as Bridget, the Naga serpent masters of ancient India were also said to live beneath the waters in Patella, and they were expert healers. And springs, such as Efka in Palmyra, were named after the serpent deity residing there. In Greek myth, the serpentine god Poseidon and the serpent Typhoon were water and spring deities with many watery places taking on their names. Even in the temples of Aesculapius, we find the pools of healing, a healing which is directly associated with the serpent. This element of the healing serpent within the water simply crossed over into the water itself, and thereafter the water became the healing element. Added to this, the concept that water was seen as the portal to the other world, and we have an association of the water of the gods healing mankind. Beneath the temple in Jerusalem, there is the serpent pool or dragon pool. What is it for? No one is quite sure. It may be that here lay the Hebrew secret of the healing water in the name serpent. The Gnostic Jews known as the Essene were said to have used pools to heal and they are connected to the healing serpent in many ways. Their original name, Orphites meant serpent worshippers. It may indeed be that the baptism has its root in this idea of the serpent healer, being born again to new and eternal life by being submerged into the waters of the serpentine other world. 
by returning to Atlantis. An indication that this may be true is found in the fact that baptism has its roots in other ancient societies, such as India. Here, the initiate was dipped three times into the sacred waters. In Greece, they even kept a holy vessel which carried the sacred waters of the healing serpent. The Egyptian Horus was baptized by Anu, the baptizer, and so the origin of baptism is much older than we previously understood. And, as we can see, it is firmly rooted in civilizations which are central to the development of the serpent-worshipping cult, namely Egypt and India, and the origins of the myth of Atlantis. A larger version of this basic truth is seen in the story of the Flood, the deluge that sank Atlantis and other fabled islands across the world. In Indian lore, the many-headed serpent Vishnu tells Manu about the coming deluge and so saves mankind from certain death, only to be symbolically reborn again after the deluge and from the waters. It is the serpent which has the powers to create the chaos of the flood, and the serpent which can save, in the same way that it has the venom to kill and the venom to cure. And so we can see from language, mythology, history, and folklore that the people we are calling Atlanteans spread across the world, possibly following some cataclysmic event, and took with them knowledge of the healing serpent, astronomy, navigation, and more. And all of this goes right back in time to the origins of civilization itself, to the ancient gods themselves. And we must remember that to live beneath the waves under the sacred waters was in fact the place of the gods, to live where no human could. To survive in the other world, only the gods could live there. This is the tale of the divine alien like angelic beings the Bible calls watchers, otherwise known as the sons of God. The tale of these watchers is found in the legends of Samaria and even in the Old Testament. Samaria was the land of the watchers and it is from this land that the Elohim or shining ones who governed the watchers also came. This is the land of origins and the governing gods. The term Elohim used often in the Old Testament as a word for God is an incorrect usage as the term is plural and means shining ones. The term, in fact, seems to have spread around the globe with man in his very language. The Sumerian El means simply bright or shining. The Old Irish Alel means shining. Old Cornish El means shining. Elf means shining. Hence elves as tall and mysterious angelic beings. Inca Allah is bright or to shine. Babylonian Elu is to shine. To name just a few that have sprung up worldwide from the same Sumerian source. The stark fact of the matter is that in the same way a pharaoh of Egypt was a god on earth, so to priest of the Elohim were stars on earth. The Hebrews term these watchers as non resh ayin, meaning those who watch. In the Greek, this is translated as gigantes or giants, a race that even the writer Hesiod featured as being monstrous. Now we can understand the role of the giants that are seen across the world of folklore as the presence of the watchers, and possibly why Atlanteans were seen as tall by some. These watchers, according to the Book of Jubilees, are the sons of God, spoken of in Genesis, sent from their heavenly abode to instruct men. 
What seems to have occurred is that they fell from grace by mating with the daughters of men and were thus outcast, giving us the fallen angels we are familiar with today. However, not all these watchers descended from the heavenly abode and were termed holy watchers, residing in the fifth heaven. As Enoch himself had testified against these fallen watchers, he was protected by the ruling shining ones and transported to the Garden of Eden. Eden itself means plateau and is therefore a specific place. According to Andrew Collins in From the Ashes of Angels, The Forbidden Legacy of a Fallen Race, the fallen watchers swear an oath and bind themselves together. The place of this action is called Ardis, the fabled summit of Mount Hermon, which derives from the Hebrew word for curse. Following these actions of the fallen watchers, the Shining Ones call down a great flood upon the earth to destroy the offspring, and Noah is warned to build a great ship to escape the impending doom. Here we have the origin of the great cataclysm, which ultimately destroyed the home of these Atlanteans, or Watchers. It is the links to these ancient Watchers and Atlanteans that has spawned much of the idea that they were in fact aliens. They fell to Earth, did battle in the sky, and more. Much of this myth of the Watchers is found to be within the tales of war and merging of peoples across the Middle East between Canaanites, Egyptians, Sumerians, and even Asian civilizations. But the underlying current is a belief in the Shining Ones as leaders, with Watchers doing their bidding. In the Bible, these became angels and God himself. In the tales of Atlantis, they became the Atlanteans, lost in the mists of time. What remains are tales created to teach us, just as Plato was trying to tell us that mankind is doomed to failure because of his evil ways. So, to the Shining Ones as sons of gods, were also doomed to commit the same sins. It is a tale as old as man, for man is doomed to repeat the same cycles of self-destruction. Atlantis is based on very real places and events. From the Aztec and Mayan Atlantis to Santorini or Thera in the Mediterranean, these were real civilizations that offered up their ancient history to the writers of the past and became known as Atlantis. They originated from an ancient world that was the real Atlantis. It was a place inhabited by the men of renown who had great knowledge and a great civilization that is only glimpsed through the looking glass of history, myth, and legend. They are spoken of in Sumerian legend, biblical texts, and myths from around the globe. Their way of life, cities, and cultures were destroyed in a massive worldwide cataclysm, and only remnants remained to tease us today. Atlantis is now a concept based loosely around natural disasters and lost civilizations, but created to tell us the ultimate truth that we are not perfect. It is a lesson from a lost civilization for us all. <laughs>